So after gathering all your information with an anesthetic assessment, you find a plethora of medical issues. So what is your very next step? So really, your very next step is can this patient's medical condition be improved? So the first exercise, if it is yes, then you refer to a specialist and facilitate optimization. But I want you now to think about some examples of optimizing a patient. So first of all, just in your in your books, I, I just want you to write down or tell your partners uh, what would make you believe that a patient with you know whatever disease X disease is optimized or not, and what would you what would make you believe that that patient is not optimized or could or the patient's disease could be improved. So I just want you to take thirty seconds to have a quick chat about that. If a patient's disease will be optimized, if they're on the medications that they should be on, you know, beta blocker for atrial fibrillation or amiodarone, or, or if they're on the appropriate amount of insulin and their endpoint markers, their BSLs are normal. Absolutely right. The other things that I think about then are, has this patient seen a regular specialist? And that's always a good indication. If someone hasn't seen a cardiologist or a specialist in years, then I'm, I'm a bit concerned that they might not be optimized. Plus, they might be symptomatic if they're not optimized. Um, so what would make you suspect that the patient's disease could be improved? I guess, as you say, if they're, if they're symptomatic and, and um, showing signs of um, whatever their comorbidity is, like heart failure, mm -hmm. um, if you thought someone was in heart failure with fluid overload, you'd want to make sure that um, you could improve their fluid status by um, you know, giving furosemide or um, yeah, referring to cardiology for um, an echocardiogram prior to the um, procedure. Fantastic. And a lot of this will be a gut feeling, right? So if you think that this patient is not quite right, it's very fair for you to say, look, I don't think this patient's optimized to your consultant and then proceed with, you know, how you think you'd optimize. So why don't we go through that? Uh, a 60 year old male presents for an elective lap collie. He said he had a mild heart attack 12 months ago with no intervention. Hasn't seen a cardiologist after his hospital admission and seems lost to follow up. So he's on no meds, very good exercise tolerance. But what could you or what would you do to optimize this patient? So just take 30 seconds to talk out loud uh, what you could do, what medications you could specifically give or uh, any other management you could do before you would go ahead. It's for an elective lap collie and has a history of possibly a mild heart attack 12 months ago <laughs> and hasn't seen a cardiologist since and is on no medications. So things we can organize, I guess, to assess this patient would be starting with an ECG, a stress echo, and a referral to cardiology to see if he needs to be, if any intervention needs to be done or That's if- That's absolutely perfect. So this is elective, so I've got lots of time for optimization. So you'd probably just send them to their cardiologist for review because you're not really sure what's going on. And often these patients should be on some medications as well. Now let's just alter that situation. Let's say it's an urgent operation. Let's say it's in maybe a more urgent uh, lap collie. Um, uh, because of ascending cholangitis or whatever it is, what would you, what medications could you then potentially give in this operation just to make it potentially safer for this patient? If we could trial them on antiplatelets, or if we had time, an angiogram. I don't know. Yeah, no, sure. <laughs> and obviously, because they're having surgery, I wouldn't want to do the antiplatelets straight away. But then I'd to think about giving antiplatelets straight away after the operation, like say within that 24, 48 hours based on how bad the surgery bleeding risk is, that absolutely is appropriate. I may start aspirin straight away though. So that, that could be useful, especially if it's a low bleed risk surgery like a lap collie. And maybe if they, you know, in consultation with a cardiologist, maybe I would start a beta blocker. Again, these aren't things that you'd necessarily do, but as a junior, being, being able to pick this up and just make a bit of a judgment call where you're you know, offering value, I think is a very useful skill to have. And I just want you to give you the confidence in this section to think about how you could optimize these patients. So that's what I've said, you do a full workup if they're elective, review, echo, angio, consider treatment, regular follow-up. And then if it's an urgent case, aspirin, beta blocker, make sure they've got good analgesia and then post-operatively, do they need to be on any other uh, antiplatelets uh, like clopidogrel? Um, there's some new guidelines with dual antiplatelet therapy from the ACCAHA, which say that essentially everyone who's had even a mild, uh, you know, an, a mild non-STEMI should be on uh, dual antiplatelets for at least 12 months. Um, and again, it's very much cardiology territory. So for this next one, uh, asthma. So this patient, 20 year old female presents with RF wrist fracture from a fall. Prior to the general anesthetic, you auscultate and notice wheezing. She reports well controlled aspirin normally. What do you do? I don't know if it's probably going to be an emergent case or, or possibly non-emergent, but either way, if it is non-emergent mm -hmm. and I've got time, um, I'll consider doing further workups such as, I guess, lung function tests. But mm -hmm. if it's not, then we need to proceed 
quickly. Yes. Um, or subacutely, um, mm. I would make sure I rule out an infective process if that's okay. See what medication she's on for asthma normally, and then optimize the medicines essentially. So whether that be her preventer, optimize her uh, short acting things. But that's good, right? Why isn't so? I, I like the fact. I like the way you're thinking. So now imagine this patient is in your anesthetic bay. You've just seen yeah. the patient. You definitely have to go ahead with his wrist fracture, almost definitely. Um, and yeah. you, what, what can you do right there in the anesthetic room before you go to theater? You've got like five minutes, 10 minutes to do this. What could you give her? I would give her some salbutamol. That's exactly what I want you to give. So I'd give a nebulized salbutamol ipratropium bromide mix, put it in the nebulizer, Hudson mask combination, and then do that. Again, think about what this is as a junior registrar. This is actually a very simple skill to do, but it can be just really, really useful uh, for the patient, but also show a lot of insight to your consultant. So, you know, find that wheezing patient and sort that out before they go in. And just think how bad it is if you didn't treat this. The patient has bronchospasm on induction, which is pretty common in even, you know, non-asthmatics. But if they're asthmatic, uncontrolled with wheeze and a smoker, you're almost guaranteed of bronchospasm, which is definitely not a place you want to be in. And these days, people aren't listening to lungs that much. So, you know, it's just not a thing that's uh, I'm seeing a lot of my trainees do or even my even my colleagues doing. So, again, something you can do really easily. Now, this patient, a 30 year old male presents for inguinal hernia repair, reports significant reflux today. What can you do to mitigate the risk? And that's a right. You may have not heard of this. Um, so it's sodium citrate. Um, Metacropamide you could give to just increase gastric emptying. Um, PPIs, yep, over days to, you know, over hours to days may, may, may work as well. Um, and just for your own information, uh, the fact that someone gets reflux, significant reflux, most anesthetists would rarely postpone an operation. They'd probably, if it was significant and you could feel liquid coming up, they'd just do a rapid sequence induction and intubate instead of putting an LMA in. But that's great. That's the way I want you to think. I want you to think, what can I do right now? to solve this and whether it's a PPI or something fast tracking, that's great. Um, again, just a few more tools for you to do this with. Just know that there's not a lot of good evidence for this. Um, but again, again, as a trainee, I want you to have, have an insight into this and then be able to offer it to show that insight. Now, that was the optimization stuff. So you've done a history, you've seen some problems that you maybe not uh, aren't so happy with and you realize the patient could be better than what they are for this elective or this emergent operation. And you can actually do things. Any questions before we move on to the next section? Um, just a quick one here. With the rapid sequence induction, if someone has severe reflux and they were fasted, when yes. would you make that call that you would decide to rap do rapid sequence induction? Would you assess if your treatment, like the um, sodium citrate has worked or, because that's uh, what we would discuss in terms of in our group when you would do oh, yeah. rapid sequence. Not a lot of evidence for this. So uh, if it's reflux, that means there's an esophageal sphincter problem, which you're not going to solve with sodium citrate anyway, but I'm going to decrease the acidity of it and that will happen pretty instant, instantly. Um, yeah. So that, that's how that will happen. Um, some really good questions here. Someone said regional technique is an option. Absolutely, that, that's, that's absolutely an option with this as well. If the patient wasn't anxious and didn't need sedation, yep, if they needed sedation, then I'd be less, less um, concerned. Um, would I use cricoid pressure with an RSI or not? Uh, that's a whole other section. Uh, cricoid pressure has no evidence of benefit, but you'd want to offer that because it's still part of the culture that you'd use cricoid for the rapid sequence. I don't think there's ever, ever really uh, been any good evidence for that. So when do you go ahead with elective surgery? It's when the patient's comorbidities are stable and well-controlled or optimized. And then you've got to think about this next facet.